Good morning, ladies and gents. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, member functions and privacy. We somewhat know about this thing before because we, uh, day one, when we talked about object orientation, I kind of demonstrated a little bit about you, what does it mean to have member functions and the privacy and what these things are uh, meant to, uh, what do they mean together. Okay, so uh, going back to what we've talked about uh, last day, I'm going to bring up the last thing we have done, the 18th, just to quickly go through it and understand, like kind of um, see what we have done last time. So in here, I'm going to I'm going to call this. Um, and I'm going to call this uh, 1 or 0, 1 EMA flashback. So, eh, quickly go through uh, the dynamic memory allocation. Uh, why did we need dynamic memory allocation at all? Uh, because sometimes we don't need, we do not need about the perfect size of the yeah, sometimes we don't know about the perfect size of what we need, and then what do we do? We allocate dynamic memory. Uh, why? What has dynamic memory allocation has to do with not knowing what the size of the memory is at compile time? I love it when, when they use words that I have to dig into my dictionary to see what's going on. <laughs> Make the code more versatile, yeah. So essentially what we do with dynamic memory allocation is, is we don't know how much memory we need at compile time. As we mentioned, when you're actually doing compilation, you're, you're creating any type of memory. When you compile it, those memory are within your executable. So the executable program that is a result of compilation actually holds the value, uh, holds the, the variable, arrays, whatever you have. And therefore, when they get loaded into memory, when the executable runs and everything goes and finished and the executable ends after the end of the execution, when executable is taken off the memory uh, using operating system, all the memory within will go away. But when we are doing dynamic memory allocation, that is not the case. When program actually runs during the execution, we decide how much memory we need. So our executable doesn't contain our memory. The memory that we need, we ask the operating system to give it to us, not the, not the compiler. And what is the statement to request the operating system to give us memory? It's three letters. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's new. So when I say new, I essentially ask the OS, I want this much new whatever. Okay? And unlike C language that you cannot say what do you want? You have to only give the C language the size of the memory. If you do dynamic memory allocation with C, you have to measure and see what is the size of the thing you have and how many of those you need. Then you have to ask C to give me that many bytes of memory. And then you have to manage it. In C++, because it's object oriented, you don't need to do that. You simply say, I want five employees. And C++ not only creates allocates enough memory to fit five employees, but actually creates five employees and puts them in those memories and give it to you. So you will have essentially five dynamic objects. And when the program ends, the executable goes away. What happens to those memory? They are removed. No. They stay in memory. They stay in memory because we ask the operating system to do what we want to do. We ask the operating system to do the dynamic memory allocation. And because of that fact, when the program ends, I have to request the operating system to remove the memory I reserved. And there is a keyword to, that, to make that request. What is the keyword? 
delete. So with delete, I essentially tell to operating system, hey, I'm done with this thing, and, I'm, and I don't want it anymore. Now, if you only want one memory, one object to you, one employee, you simply say new employee. But if you want 50 employees, then you have to actually do it in an array format, okay? New employee, and then in the, uh, uh, like square brackets in front of the employee, you say 20, and then 20 employees will be allocated for you. But at deleting time, that's the time that's moment of truth to see if you have memory leak or not. If you have one object, you say delete, but if you have many objects in an array, you have to say delete and put a couple of square brackets after the delete to make sure everything is wiped out properly. And if you don't do that, when you're submitting your workshop, Val Green's gonna catch you, tells you, hey, wait, you have memory leak over here. You allocated, but you forgot to deallocate. And that was a gist of what we've done in here. So essentially, we had a structure name, and in, the, in our name, we had pointers to, to characters instead of actually creating um, uh, strings over there. So my structure over here is only if assuming a pointer size is four, is two variables with size of four. So the total size that name takes in memory is eight characters. It's eight bytes. Remember, when we say character in C++, what do we mean? That, that the size of that integer is? A character takes four bytes? A character oh, takes? <laughs> Did it for you. <laughs> okay, character takes one byte, okay? Because, uh, so, so that's the thing, okay? But anyway, anyway, when we say character pointer, it's not character anymore. It's an integer that holds the address of a character, therefore it's gonna take four bytes as mentioned. Good morning. All right. I need oxygen. <laughs> All right, so, so that's how dynamic memory allocation worked over here. We said we're gonna have a structure for the name, but we'll not, because we don't know what the size of the name is, we just create the pointers for it. Then we created functions to set, the name, which essentially in that setting thingy well, for, the, for the name, what we did, we simply check the size of the name that is coming in and the size of the surname that is coming in. We allocate, did it move up? I didn't do it. <laughs> Magic, okay. Is it one of those touch thingy? No. Anyway, so <laughs> I could scroll up, it would be nice, eh? <laughs> So yeah, so as I was saying, I allocate exactly, I, I first measure to see what is the size of incoming name. I allocate that much space and I always leave one for null because we know C strings are simply character arrays marked by the end of the data that is a null, right? And allocate exactly that much memory and then uh, if both allocations are successful, I simply copy the name into the newly allocated memory. And uh, if anything goes wrong, I have to make sure no memory leak is happening. So if one of them goes bad, I have to make sure they are deleted. So the question comes like, if it goes bad, name is gonna be, for example, name is gonna be successful, but surname is not going to be successful. Name is not null with memory allocated. Surname is not, so surname remains uh, uh, null. Then it comes over here, not null, and null together is false, comes over here. When it deletes the name, because the, what we wanted was unsuccessful, life is beautiful, it deletes it. But when it comes to surname, surname is null. The mechanism inside the delete works that way. If it's null, it doesn't do anything. There is no error. It just says, oh, it's null, I'm not gonna delete anything because it's not pointing anywhere. And then uh, making sure that they are both null at the same, following the sacred rule of having uh, pointers null after uh, when we are not using them, we set them both to null. And the same thing for the allocate. So essentially what you see, what is the problem with the code that you see over here, my dear? How could it be more efficient? 
How could the code be more efficient? What do you see over there that is repeating? There is a repeating pattern. Can anybody tell me what is the repeating pattern over there? Yeah, so line number 47 to 49. Do you see that? And line number 53 to 55. Don't you see anything common between the two? So why the heck I'm writing it twice? That's bad programming. Right? I already have that thing. So if that's the case, I don't need to think of what I'm supposed to do again. I deallocate. Correct? That's one bug from the thing. So that's one of the things that you need to know. If you have repeating code, that means you need a function. Always. When you have repeating code, you need a function. Why? Because tomorrow if I go and say, okay, this is not the way to delete. I have to do this and that. Then I have to go search all my code to see where did I do the deleting stuff and change them all. If I organize it like this, then I fix it at one place and everywhere is going to be fine. Are we good? Good. We are fixing Fardad's code. All right. Printing. You always, when you're dealing with dynamic memory allocation, you have to make sure that what you have actually is there. Okay? Now, we can either check to see if they're both pointing to something or not to print them. And also, depending on what the business logic is, when I say business logic, I mean what the program is supposed to do based on the process that is happening within our logic. Like, is an empty name possible or not? If, it's, if an empty name is possible, then I have to check for it and not to print it, right? But if empty name is not possible based on our logic, I don't need to check for it. Don't blindly do it. Take a look at the code and see what the code does. If, for example, this was some kind of an application I was writing for someone and I was supposed to actually check and make sure there are data available in uh, where M name and M surname is pointing, then I had to say over here and and M name zero and and M surname zero to make sure that the, they are not only available, they are pointing to a piece of memory, but the memory that are pointing actually has data in it. Okay, if it's an empty string, then there is no name, right? So keep that in mind. Otherwise, if they are both blank, this is not going to print anything. So if I needed to write this properly based on what the program wants, we might want it to add this too. So this guarantees not only M name, bonjour, it uh, not only uh, guarantees that M name and M uh, surname are pointing to data, but also the place they are pointing to actually has a string. The definition of a string is uh, the, yeah, is uh, characters ending by a null. If the first character is null, then there is no data, right? It's an empty string. The string is there, but it's empty. So if I say coffee cup, okay, or if I say water bottle, that's a mistake. That's a logical mistake. Okay? If I say water bottle and it's empty, still that's a mistake because there is a water bottle, but there is no water in it. So it's no use for me, right? Same thing. All right, so we know that. Reading dynamic memory allocation usually happens like this when you're a rookie. Okay? When you are getting dynamic memory allocation, what you do first you do it in IPC 144 way, but the difference is that in IPC 144, you put the maximum value possible for everyone. When you do dynamic memory allocation, you do maximum that size possible only for one read. So what you do in your read, you have the maximum size possible. You read the values, but then you adjust it. And those are local variables go away. If you have 5,000 names, you're not going to have 5,061s and 5,081s. Every single read will resize the value to the exact size and then puts in the structure name. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? 
Are we okay one? Are we okay two? They're all good? Beautiful. Okay. So that's the read. Anything else down to this point? Any questions? Suggestions? Objections? Remember about that hello thingy that I said at the beginning of the semester? You don't remember the hello thingy I said? I, hello. I said if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody say, telling you hello. You don't remember that? You remember? Seriously, you don't remember that? That was a horror story. I scared everyone. Oh, yeah. Ah, she remembers what I said, the horror story. Hello. All right. So we are in that thing right now. We are in that territory right now. I have functions over here that they're doing things, awful things, like something is getting printed, but the print doesn't belong to anyone. This is not object oriented. The first <laughs> rule of Fight Club. Ah, you're too young for that. Yeah, so the first, <laughs> you're too young for that. Anyways, the, the first uh, rule of object orientation was encapsulation, which was, <laughs> when somebody looking away when you want to ask a question, it means it's their turn. <laughs> Variables and? Um, I don't know. If, if we do variables and. We have two types of things. There are two types of things in your code. Always remember that. Data in your, good morning. Data, data in your program. <laughs> you know I'm going to ask the question, right? Yeah, OK. <laughs> so when you are writing code, OK, it's all data. Everything over here is data, right? Well, when you look at the code, this data can be categorized in two different things. What are those? It's very difficult. No, I never taught this. It's IPC 144, actually. The data and, can you repeat the question? Okay. When you see your code, when you write, pro, write a program, this main thingy that you see over here, right? When you look at this program, there are two types of data in here. When you insert code into computer's memory, there are two major categories of data in there. What are those two? Uh, Don't tell me float and integer or kill myself. <laughs> input and output? No. It's a difficult question. Uh, and? You just got 2% for your midterm. You just got 2% for your midterm. Okay, so when because that's a very difficult question, it's in, very difficult to grasp. When you put data in your computer, there are two types of data. Siri, one of them, one category, is pure data. Someone's age, color of your hair, uh, height of the ceiling, weight of your body. These are data. And the other data are instructions to CPU how to deal with the other data. Those are called operations. So in here, I have data, data, operation, operation, data and operation, operation, data, operation. So as you see, this happens, right? So data and operation. And how do I got to this point? And I said, what is the uh, when when we when we were when we are dealing the very first rule of object orientation is called encapsulation, which is putting data and operations into the same structure, into the same class, and that we call encapsulation. This code is not encapsulated because all the things that are happening to a structure of name is scattered all over the place. I'm saying set. Set what? I have to look at the arguments of the set to see what the set is supposed to set. That's wrong. When I'm saying print, show, essentially, 
I have to pass, that's exact opposite of object orientation. Instead of print belonging to the name, print is actually something that does not belong at all. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. So like, let's make this thing encapsulated. Okay? So we have the code. We've seen how it works. We went through it. We know exactly what it is. Let's fix it. Okay? So first of all, nah, no first of all. First let me do it, and then I'm going to modularize it if that's the name for it. Okay? If that's even a word. Okay, so this is the DMA flashback that we had, and I save it. Okay, now I'm going to copy everything and put it in here. I want that. So this is what we had, right? OK. At the beginning of the semester, I mentioned that in C++, unlike C, you can actually bring the operations, the functions, into the structure. And we said, never mention, never call mname a variable. OK? What do we call mname? Member. Member variable. or Attribute or pass. no, not pass. It's data. Okay, so data, right? So what, these are like member attributes, data attributes, member member variables, attributes, data of something, or specifications of something. Okay, so if you don't know this, just come up with things. <laughs> okay, so so we we have the attributes inside a name. I know a name has a name as a surname, right? I know that. We should have called it first and last, actually. But hey, OK. Shall we change it? See, that, that's, uh, you see me do stuff like this. That's a little bit of OCD, OK? So um, a programmer, when they're designing something, I think you spend around 30% of the time if you're a good programmer, 30% of the time to the logic of how things happen, and 70% of the time how to name things. Because no matter how good is your logic, if your names are not appropriate at the end, your code is essentially worthless. Because you do logic on things that nobody understands what the heck they mean. That's why I hate people go structure name, character pointer A, character pointer B, and A holds the first name and B holds. So, so when I see name over there, I'm like, is there a name and it's called name? People may get confused. So, so this always, this inner voice is always with me. It drives me nuts, okay? So bear with me while I go nuts, okay? So having said so, <laughs> having said so, in here I'm going to do control H and I'm going to say M first name. Given name, right? Given name or first name? Which one is better? English speakers. Anybody over here is English speaker? No? No one? Seriously? <laughs> no, not English speaker, but they like their first language is English. No one? Oh, Canada. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so that's that. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. We, we, Canada is the only reason you can have hope for the entire world. All the fighting and killing that you see, we are all sitting over here as friends and laughing. That's the testament that human beings are beyond their beliefs and they're just human beings. Brothers and sisters, everyone. Anyways, no matter what you are, who you are. Anyway, so enough about wishful thinking. Let's, uh, so, so first name and surname. Given name. Camel notation. Okay, that's fair. Now, now, now I can sleep comfortable tonight. Okay, so, so we're okay now? 
All right? So let's do this. Now, set is setting what? A name, correct? So we can just take it out of here and put it inside here. OK? So I want to say, name, set yourself. When I say yourself, do I need to pass the yourself to yourself? No. Because set is inside the name, all the attributes are the name, are visible to what type of a function is set? What do we call? We don't call them functions, as we didn't call the other one variables. This function is called a function. Method, thank you. Method or the easy one, the one that C++ calls it. So wait a minute. A variable, we call it member variable. A function, we call it member function. Member function. OK, it's a member. So set is now a member function. Therefore, all the, all the member variables are visible to the member functions because all the same place. Remember, like if my head scratches, I'm going to know that it's my head. Um, if my head scratches, I'm not going to go this. I'm going to scratch my own head because I know where my head is, correct? Are we OK with this? It's the same thing over here. Set knows where its stuff are. So if they want to be set, first of all, I don't need to pass this, the name to the set because that's just stupid, OK? So I'm going to say set the name and the surname. OK? And then what I'm going to do? In here, when I'm actually, what is the set? In here, I have to say, hey, set is not just a set sitting around. It belongs to someone. Now, if I have a member variable and I want to show that it belongs to something, belongs to a structure, what do I put beside it? I put a dot when I want to use it, right? But when you want to show membership, membership, you know what does it mean? Either member variable or, so if you want to show membership, you use scope resolution. Scope resolution is two dots. So what I can do over here, I can say, hey, set belongs to name. OK? Having said so, now set is part of name. Therefore, it has access to all the M underlying stuff. I don't need to say N anything. All I need to say is this, this. So all the references to the owner will be gone because set and Set the allocate name over here, actually. Uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And this one, I'm not going to have an N, OK? So because of now, so then comes the problem with the allocate. The allocate, each class should be able to deallocate its own data. So this time, to show you that you can actually have the member functions inside the class, I'll put the entire thing in here. It's exactly like you, and obviously I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't need this. So you can write the entire thing inside the class. This is called inline coding. Not a very good thing to do. Usually you like to have your prototype somewhere and then you code in a CPP file, right? So that's why we don't. I'm just going to write it over here when I'm putting it as a module, you will see. So I could have put set inside too. As a matter of fact, many languages like Java, they don't even have anything that you can put outside. You have to put everything inside a class. There is no module in this sense. OK, so but in C++, that's not the case. You put what you need inside a class, what you 
you introduce what the class can do in the structure, then outside of the structure in the CPP file, you explain how. Do we understand what I just said? In a class, you put what the class is supposed to do, okay? And outside of the class, you specify how it's supposed to be done, okay? In a header file, you put the prototype of the functions. In the CPP file, you put body of the functions. I just said that in an object-oriented way. A class introduces what it's supposed to do, and how it's supposed to do it goes into the CPP file. We good? OK. So this deallocate goes. We don't want this anymore. And in here, I'm going to come to deallocate, and I'm going to say, hey, deallocate. Where, are, where is deallocate? Oh, I put it inside. I'm looking for the allocate. So now I need to actually see how can I change the code for that. And let's actually put the print and name over there. And, and uh, uh, actually, well, we'll do it one by one. Uh, let, let's go with the deallocate and see what, how it's going to work out. So uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. what do I do? What do I do? So the deallocate is inside. I'm going to come over here first. In here, I'm saying deallocate names. Now, I'm, instead of passing the allocate uh, name into the allocate, which is extremely non-object oriented, I'm going to say, hey, names, the allocate yourselves, one by one. I request for that one to the allocate its memory. I don't need to write it that way. And in here, I don't need to say anything. I don't need to say to whom, to, to what it belongs. Because I'm in set and I'm saying deallocate, it means deallocate me, right? We are inside the thing, so we can actually do that. Are we okay with this? All right. Okay, so pray, uh, read. How do we do read? Again, the same thing. I'm going to bring the read inside. I'm going to take this outside out later. So I'm going to remove the name over here, right? So I'm not passing anything in here. And simply take the set out, and I'm done. Right? So in the method read, see, I'm calling it method now. It's not a function. It's a member function. In the method read, I have some local variables that come and go. but the, and they get the values, and, but they set the attributes of the read, of the name, to the values that are coming and going. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? All right. And so I don't need read over here anymore. And print. So let's first analyze print. I'm going to bring it out. Let's analyze and see what print does. So print is receiving a constant name. Print is receiving a constant name. Print is receiving a constant name because why it's receiving a constant name, not a regular name. Do you remember? It cannot be changed. Yeah, it cannot be changed. Not that it cannot be changed. I could have not made it constant and changed it in print. But I was a very bad designer then. If you look at me, do I lose weight? No. Right? I wish. But no. When you show something, nothing changes in it. Correct? So the nature of printing is not to do anything to the owner. OK? That's what it is. You need, to, you need to realize that. You have to look at the logic of your code and based on that, make things constant. Always, always, always. Extremely important. Can set be constant? No, because it's changing the object. Can read be constant? No, because we put in information in the thing. Can print be constant? Yes, it has to be constant because it is not changing it. So how do we enforce that? If I bring the print in, 
if I bring the print in and I remove the schmiggly dinghy over here and just and change all these things like that, if I remove the argument and just do it like this, <clears throat> although it works, this is one of the things that drives professors nuts when the students come and say, but it works. Okay, but it works is the worst thing you can say to a professional programmer. But it works doesn't make sense. Because you should say, but it doesn't make sense. It works, but it doesn't make sense. Now, print could change any of these things with no problem, correct? But it's not supposed to. So if your print in a C world, when it receives it, it receives a constant name, you can enforce that by adding a constant between these two guys. If I can type it. Which essentially means print is a member function that does not change the owner. So now in here, if for some reason I go bananas and go m given a given name is equal to null ptr, now it's going to actually be saying expression must be a modifiable value. What are you doing? It's a constant value. Anything that belongs to name in print is constant. You cannot change it. Why? Because I said so. Got it? All right. So I'm going to say over here, cannot because print is const. Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay? Okay, one. Okay, two. All right. So what else do we have? Oh, set is already there. I'm going to bring it up. OK, so that's, it's not encapsulated, but it's a first attempt of making something encapsulated, putting the data and behavior together. But putting the data and behavior is not the only thing you need to do, OK? You need to privatize things that belongs to, to the name and nobody should touch. Remember about, I hope she can remember that. Did I remember about uh, telling you about borrowing money for a coffee? Remember that? That you have to enforce too. You need to be able to enforce that nobody can touch anything that belongs to, to the name without name's permission. We need to do that too. But before doing that, let's put this thing in modules so we can actually organize our brains. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if I come over here and I change, I just realized something. Yeah, that's much better. OK. So oh, you have a private screen, obviously. Important man. <laughs> Let me adjust it for you. <laughs> OK, so, so, uh, so if I want to look at my main now in here, this print names is wrong. I have to say. <clears throat> print zero, uh, name zero dot print, print yourself. And in here I have to say, name I, read yourself. And then in here I say, names I, print yourself. It just looks like I just copied and pasted something from somewhere and that's it. But it's much more than more than that, please appreciate the beauty here. You are not. Every single object knows how to do its own stuff. You don't need to worry about it anymore. And you don't need to worry about what type of a function you're supposed to call to make things happen because name has all the things it needs. Okay? If it doesn't, you can always create helper functions. We'll come to that later. Helper functions are essentially What's the difference between C++ and Java? 
what's the difference between C++ and Python or Smalltalk? These are other languages that are object-oriented. The difference is that Java tries to have everything really object-oriented with no backdoors, which means you cannot have a main in Java. Main is a function that doesn't belong to anyone, right? So it's right from the beginning, it's a violation of object orientation, right? Main is where everything begins, okay? It belongs to your application. It doesn't belong to anyone. So what Java does, it actually creates a class and puts the main inside the class and says this, this main inside this class is the main, something like that, to just go over it. C++ doesn't do that. C++ always leaves the back door in case things go wrong. And because uh, remember, a simulation is always a simulation. It's never exact, right? When you simulate something, anything that you simulate, it's not exact. It, it lacks stuff. That's just fact. In C++, that's the case. We try to make everything object-oriented, but when we reach the point that we can't anymore, then you can create standalone functions that help you do stuff with your classes where you couldn't possibly create a method for it. What is a method? It's a member function, right? It's a member function. So, so that's, that's it, but not when it's inconvenient. Don't take the two things. Not like, oh, I don't want, who's going to create a method? I'm just going to create a helper. No, not, not like that. You should absolutely see that there is no other way than you can create a helper function, okay? That, I'm telling you in advance because in, later we're going to come and you're going to see many books, many profs give you examples on, of absolutely unnecessary member functions. Member functions that could have been methods, okay? If that's the case, just don't do it, okay? So now my main over here, let me just make sure that it works, is using that semi-encapsulated thing in the same way. I'm not gonna go through it, you know how it works. I'm gonna put the number of names, it's done. okay? Let's modularize it. <clears throat> Remember what I told you at the beginning of the semester when I say core, what do you have to make? You have to go through a certain process. I'll do it now. I want to have a name. As soon as I say a name, this happens. <clears throat> because I'm lazy, I'm going to right click over here and I'm going to say add class. Class name is name. And when I click OK, it creates both files for me so I don't have to create it. But as you see, instead of struct, it says class. OK? Don't worry. Class, struct, potatoes, potatoes. Same thing. OK? They just added a new keyword to make it object oriented because object oriented is essentially uh, what they call. Encapsulation happens, encapsulate happens inside classes, but structure is a perfect place to encapsulate things in, so a structure is a class, no difference. So I'm going to change that name to struct, and then you'll see what is the real difference between the two. So this is struct name, and then in here, pragma once, I'll remove it. I'm going to write if not define, uh, Seneca underline name underline h, copy that paste it, and right here define, and then namespace, namespace Seneca, and I'll do like this, and I'll bring the structure in. That's my empty module, right? Now I'll go to the name.cpp, name.cpp is complete, the only thing that I need over here is, is namespace Seneca. Right? 
Then I bring the, the class in. So struct name, I'll bring it right over here, the entire thing, C. I'm going to bring the struct in, okay? Then I'm going to remove all the bodies. So in here, I'm going to do like that, and I'm going to do like this, and I'm going to do like this. So it becomes only the attribute, right? Then I'm going to go back to name.cpp, and I'm going to put all the functions there. So I'm going to come back in here. Again, I'm going to copy and paste it all over here, right? And, <clears throat> oh, what did I do? So I, sorry, I don't need this. I just bring the functions in. So I'm going to bring the member functions in and shift everything to left. All right. Now, at the beginning of each, I'm going to add name scope resolution. It means these belong to name. Copy. Paste it and copy there, copy here, and that's that. Okay? Then what else I need? I had the set thingy. I'm going to bring it over here. Replace it. Okay? So I have all these things. So I have all the name stuff here. I have all the name stuff over here. Uh, <clears throat> in here, I do not need any of these anymore. All I need to have is include, actually, C, do I need a C string? Do you see a string copy in here? No. So I don't need C string. So in here, I'll say include uh, name.h, okay? And I believe I need to, do I have anything in here? I don't think even I need this. It goes out. Now I'm going to go back to name.cpp, and I'll add all the stuff that I need in here. So control V in here. What I'm going to do, uh, uh, include string C string, right? Oh, C string, right? So include C string. What else do I need? I O stream because of C out. So I'm going to say include, oh, output. I like to put the C++. This is how I include <clears throat> uh, the header files. First come the C++ library, then C library, then custom ones. Okay? Always do it in this way, not to, to minimize the possibility of conflict. So in here, I'm going to say include IO stream. And obviously, in here, I need to be using namespace std. Uh, Let's go back to name. Do I need any header file here? No, I don't need any header file. Does, do you see anything, any functions being used in? No. So include your header files where they are needed. Don't, it is extremely important to never do just in case include. It's a very bad thing, okay? Don't do that. So. It, so, for example, your name to get implemented, use a C string, right? My main over here is not using C string and using namespace Seneca. Okay. Okay. Okay, using namespace Seneca. So now um, if I compile, let me, I'm just going to compile, see if it compiles, and then we're going to continue. So it compiles. Now it's the modular way of having the same thing. But the, diff, the problem over here is this. Take a look. In here, I can say, it's, I'm saying name zero print, new name num, and I'm reading one by one. Now in here, I can say names zero dot right I just created memory leak because I could just it's as if I just removed his glasses and I went out 
Like, what the heck? Like, where's my gossip? Like, so I should not. It's a private property of name. I shouldn't be able to touch it. So anything that you see, you do not need to give access to outsiders to. You make it private. So in here, first of all, the attributes. See, there is no rule that tells. This is another common mistake. Attributes are private. Methods are public. BS. That's not the case at all. There are many attributes that is open to everyone. And there are many methods that are private to everyone. It is just a fact. Right? It is just a fact. So in this case, it happens to be private. So in here, I will say private, given name, yada, yada, yada. And then in here, I'm going to say public. Well, when you take a look at it, does anybody need to be able to set the name? It depends on your business logic. If your name is only supposed to be read from the console, you make set private. You follow what I'm saying? You make set private. That's number one. Number two is uh, making sure that, uh, yeah. So you make it private. If not, you make it public. In this case, because my main is not using the, it's just an example, people. I know you should be able to set a name. When you create a variable, you want to set it, right? So if I do it like this, oh. now the program won't, won't compile. It's going to give me an error. Why? It's going to tell me what the heck you're doing. That thing is private. You can't touch it. Now my code is more safe. Because <clears throat> that guy's trying to look, at, look through it, this hole over here. <laughs> Let's share this because he's going like that. <laughs> All right. All right. So that is not possible because it's private. That is member functions and privacy. And that's it. Okay. That's member functions and privacy. And that's essentially what it is. You, you put everything in its place and uh, there is one thing that you need to know, like, for example, in here, any, any questions down to this point about member functions and privacy? So member function is essentially what an object can do. You put it in there, and they have access to all the attributes. They can have read-write access or read-only access based on what they are doing. Uh, and that's that. Okay. Now, in here, I initialized <clears throat> the values of given name and surname. Believe it or not, this is something very new in C++. C++ used to didn't have that one. You couldn't actually set stuff inside the structure. You had to do it only through the methods. If that's the case, then to be able to actually use the name, I needed to be able to initialize it, right? So like the allocate over here, it deallocates, right? But it's not really the allocation. It finalizes stuff. So when you think about, uh, are we okay down to this point? Or not? I just want to give proper names. Remember about I said that? Like it's okay. So <clears throat> the allocate is something that deallocates memory, and it's used internally, okay? So... I would put it over here, and I would actually create a, what's well, too big? Uh, say finalized, finalize. I'm going to have something called finalize, and I'm going to have another thing called init to initialize. So the two functions over here, one's job is to initialize the struct to what it's supposed to do. And why is it giving me? I think it was, it belonged to finalize, and it went up. Okay, that tilde. Wiggly thingy that it's see. I don't think it belongs to the finals. But anyways, so 
So I can create the definition of finalize uh, in name.cpp. When you do like that, it realizes the, the screwdriver at the side, it realizes that finalize doesn't have a definition. It says, would you like to create the definition in the thing? So it does it for you. You don't have to type it. I'm going to say create the definition of finalize in name. And in here, in finalize, I'm going to say deallocate. But deallocate itself, it's something internal. As you are going through things, you need to be able to deallocate and allocate things, right? And for example, our read over here has, is, is it set? Yeah, our set over here has a ginormous mistake in it that I have not mentioned yet, OK? Because we were going through dynamic memory, I didn't want to go through the details. I'm going to fix it, depending on if it's going to be public or private. If it's private, it's OK. I know that how it works. But if you want to leave it for public to use, it has a ginormous mistake that causes memory leak. It doesn't look like it, but it's going to make, cause memory leak. So we'll fix those two. So that's finalized. And the initialize one is the one that I did the null thing you over there. So I can do it here. So in here, I can actually in, in initialize. What I will do over here is saying m uh, given name is set to m surname is set to null ptr. OK, so now when you actually create and the allocate goes away, so this is finalized, OK, which means I want to get rid of it. And the problem with this would be that you cannot just create names over here. If I say, if I actually run this code now, this is what I'm going to get. OK, I'm going to say over here too. And take a look. You see it crashed? Why did it crash? The reason is that I tried to print the name, name zero. Take a look. Let's try it one more time, see if it's going to crash now. I'll go F5. OK, so I'm going to say I want two. Now it comes over here, so it actually allocates two. Now it goes over here and tries to print it. So it says, is given name null? No, it's not. Is surname null? No, it's not. So everything is good, right? But when it wants to actually go through it and pass this one, it gives me an exception. What the heck you're doing? You're trying to access memories that don't belong to you. They are not null. In a previous one, I initialized it in here. Because initialization was not inside the structure, I have garbage inside my pointers. An address is just a number. Compiler doesn't know. The operating system doesn't know if that garbage is really an address or some, someplace forbidden to go. If there's someplace forbidden to go, it stops you. That's why if I did not have that initialization over there, I had to initialize everything before I could do anything. So I had to actually go have this for loop over here and say init. And now if I run the program and I'll go to, it simply says no name because now it initialized it to zero. You follow what I'm saying? Are we okay? All right. So that's that, right? So those are the things that I, that I got over there. So now we, we keep going forward. So the, as we created member functions and privacy over here, we realize that when classes are getting created, this is essentially a class. But classes are getting created. They need some automation in their creation. I need to be able to hack their creation and hack their destruction. What does that mean? It means I need to be able to tell to the compiler, when this object is born, I want this and this and this to happen to it. When this object dies, I want this and this and this to happen to it. Because it is no way that I can give this to students 
and students won't shoot themselves with the foot because somebody's going to forget to initialize, somebody's going to forget to finalize. Correct? So this automation is needed. I need this automation, and it is provided. I can actually add the automation to the system, telling to the system, hey, to the uh, class of mine, and tell to my class, hey, when you are getting created, I want these things to happen. When you are dying, I want these things to happen. And these two things, they look like functions, but they are not functions because you don't call them. This is not something you call. You cannot say, create this object, now initialize it. That doesn't make sense. Initialization comes with creating something. You don't, you cannot call it. The same thing, you say, when this object, after this is, or before this is dying, do that. You can't, you cannot call it. You have to, you, we have to come up with some kind of a strange prototype for a procedure. I'm not going to call it a function, I'll call it a procedure. For a special type of function that the name is so awkward that it's impossible to be repeated. So the compiler knows the procedure you are writing in here is for initialization and the procedure you are writing here is for destruction. Okay? And how do we do it? This is how it's done. So you create strange methods. So you add methods. What is a method? A member function. So you create member functions that are not really functions. What is the ver first, what is the first uh, thing that is sure about any function that 100% a function does? Is that a function has a return type, correct? It can return something or nothing, but you have to mention it. You cannot have a function that you don't say what it returns, right? So either it returns an integer or it returns what, something, right? So for example, let's say in here I can create something like int length. That gives me, and I'm going to put it const over here. Actually, let's make it size t because it's returning size. That returns the length of the name. So it tells you how much space does it take to print this name. I want to know what the size, what is the width. So if I want to write this function, the function would essentially be something like return. You see it actually shows a size t. Return strlen of actually what I have to do is this. Sorry, I have to say size t uh, len being zero first. Then I'm going to say if m name, and look at it. I have to keep testing this. I have to keep testing to see if the name is, because I have to write the exact same thing, right? So I'm going to actually copy this. So I'm going to say if this condition is present, it means there is something, then len is set to str len of m given name and plus str len of m uh, surname plus one for the space between the two because when you print a first name and a last name you put a space in between right so that's that one and in here I'm going to close it and I'm going to say return len. So this is the proper way of writing it. So as you see the function learn length is returning something. There is, so either a function returns void, which is nothing, or returns something, correct? Okay, these special functions that I mentioned that are for initialization and destruction, they carry the name of the class, which happens to be name. <laughs> they carry the name of the class and they don't return anything. So this is what you do. You write over here, name, and that's for initialization. For destruction, so this is for construction. This is for destruction. 
So you see they're really strange. They don't have any return types. They are not functions. You don't call them. This is not something you can call or reuse. You cannot go in print and call name. You cannot go in finalize and call tilde name. You can't do that. OK? Where if you do it, the compiler will not give you an error. But the results is not what you think. OK? This is this one that calls the construction, we call it a constructor. The one that caused the destruction, we call it the destructor. So we don't even call it functions. Destructor, constructor, destructor. That's a construct. This is, these are not functions. And in here, what you do is this. So essentially, in your construct, what did I do? It's doing something strange. OK. Anyway, so in this constructor, I can say init to initialize everything, right? And then bring the init to the private side, right? And in finalize, and I, and I created the finalize, and I did the allocate, right? I don't need to do that. So I'm going to remove the finalize completely, remove the finalize here completely. And in the destructor, call the allocate. OK? If I do something like this, OK, with the constructor and the destructor, if I do something like this, then I do not need to worry about anything. Take a look. So if I do that in this program of mine, I do not need to initialize, and I do not need to finalize. There is no need for initialization or final finalization. <laughs> there is no need for any of these. Because now I told the compiler, when the object is born, construct it that way. When the object is dying, when delete is called, it's going to kill everything, right? So let's actually show you something. Just, I just want to uh, show you how it happens. So in here, I'm going to uh, uh, press, uh, mm, I'm going to do something. Before I save these guys, I'm going to say over here, uh, This is uh, the last one that I had was 0, 02, right? Was it 0, 02? I think it was 0, 02. 0, 02 name uh, dot h. Let me just give me a second. Give me a second. You know what? I'll tell you why I'm doing this. So now. I created the special functions for construction and destruction here. And I don't even need init when you think about it. Because init is essentially, because this means construction means initialization. So right, having a function called init doesn't make sense either. Uh, just too many. The allocate it does because you, you want to keep the allocating. But let me just go over here. Where is the thing? So in here, instead of in it, I'm going to put the values in it. OK? OK? So now, please take a look, see what happens. When I run it, I'll go F10 over here. You know what? I'm going to do even something better. Give me a second. So I'm going to come in name.cpp over here. And in this name, I'm going to create a global variable. OK? So I'm going to call it integer uh, counter, OK? And I'm going to set it to 0, all right? Take a look. In here, I'm going to say, I'm going to go in the name. And in here, I'm going to say C out plus plus counter. So I'm going to actually show what happens. So you will see. So you know, I'm going to say. Uh, name is created. OK? 
Okay? And in here, I'm going to say C out name. minus minus counter is deleted. You don't, you never put messages in constructor and destructor, but these are debugging messages. I just want to, I just want to, uh, uh, for you to see what happens, okay? So take a look. When I run the program, what does it say? Hot reload. What? Edits were made to the code cannot be applied when debug. Ignore. What the heck? Stop. Okay. One more time. Okay. I'll explain later. Okay. So I'll go F10. So I'm going to put this at left and put this one at right. And, and, and let's just go through it and see how it happens. So in here it says this. Pointers are created. And it asks how many. Okay, I'm going to say five. Okay, and I hit enter. Just take a look as soon as I go through this. Five constructors are called. I didn't do anything. I just went through the creation. And the creation automatically invoked because five objects are created, five names are created. Right? And then... Five? Seriously? Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it and, and be more realistic. <laughs> I don't want to enter five names over there. Two would do, but uh, uh, let me just, um, and I had something in here that I had to fix. I have a space over here. I need the space. Okay. So one more. <laughs> this time I'm going to do two only. Okay. So I'm going to go, now I'm going to go with 10 again. So. It's going to tell me how many. Now I'm going to say two. And as soon as I go through the creation, as soon as I go through the creation, oh, shoot. Any place you click, something happens. OK. Uh, as soon as I go through the creation, you see two objects are created. Two name objects are created. Now, if I say the first one, obviously, it's going to be no name because the constructors set them to null. Now, it, Constructors are essentially to prepare your object for existence. That's literally why they are. They create, they prepare your object for existence. Destructor, they clean up your mess right before you want to go out. Okay, so it's exactly, constructors is when you are coming to eat, you clean up the table first and you set the table. That's the constructor. You eat and everything. Before you want to go out, you take the table stuff out, put it in a sink, clean up the table, you go out, that's the destructor, okay? Things that prepare uh, and uh, take care of things after you're gone. So now um, I'm going to run to cursor over here. It's going to get two names. Oh, shoot. I put two of them. Uh, remember I told you that uh, users are dumb? <laughs> All right, so um, run to cursor one more time. So, what the heck? Okay, one more time. Uh, run to cursor. So, yeah, so how many names? Two. It creates two names Fred, Soleil, and name is. John and Do. Okay? And I hit enter. So it comes over here. As you see, each name reads itself. Then each name prints itself. Okay? Now we come over here and it deletes the array of names, right? Therefore, the destructor of the two will be called, which is boom. Name one is deleted, name zero. And as you and remember. The construction and destruction happens like this when you actually look at it. The construction and destruction happens like this. So the first object is created. Okay. Oh, the first object is created. Then the second object. Then the fourth object. 
and then the fifth object, right? The destruction happens in reverse order. The fourth one that is created dies first, and then the third, and then the second, and the first. It's constructors always happen in reverse order. Remember that. This is extremely important because of the markers. <laughs> All right? And then it goes out. And everything is done. So if you clean up your mess in your destructor properly, if you, where is the clean up my mess? If you clean up your mess in the destructor properly, okay, because the destructor is calling the allocate, right? And you, and you, you prepare your object in the constructor properly, then everything is safe and you don't have a memory leak. But here, because of my set, I do. So if my set is not private, somebody might want to reset the name halfway through. So in here, I'm doing a read, and I'm printing. And I'm going to say name1.set. Names one dot set to uh, Homer and Simpson. Okay, so that's that's what I want to set it to, and then I want to print them again. Okay, so if I let, I'm just going to run right. Come right down to this point and execute it so you'll see what happens. Then I'll walk through it. So I'll run it right to that point. So how many names? I'm going to say two. So I have a zero and one created. So this first one is Fred, Soleil. The second one is John and Doe. Right? Are you all, all with me? So let's think about what happened now. In the read set was called and each time it allocated memory for the name and the last name in, this, in the name, right? So the name had a given name and a, and a surname. They are both dynamic. Are we all okay with this? Now take a look at this. When I call the set, when I call the set, what happens? It is Homer Simpson that is overwriting John Doe, correct? So this thing over here is now pointing to John and a zero, five characters, right? And this thing is pointing to do, correct? And a zero at the end. Are we okay with this? Now think about it for a second. This one says, give me new memory for this, to the size of Homer and overwrite given name. What's gonna happen to that? Leak in memory. That's the problem. So remember, you have to remember that in the slides I said before you delete before you, you, you use uh, a pointer, make sure that the pointers are unused, okay? That's the case. So if I am setting a name, if I am setting the name, it means if there is an old name, it has to be gone, correct? So the correct way of doing this is, at any moment when you are dynamically allocating something, and that's what I told you, this program has a bad bug in it. At any moment before you want to set something dynamically, make sure you deallocate. So first it deallocates, then it allocates. So if, the, if it's not pointing it to anything, we know how the allocate works, right? It deletes the, both, the two things. If they are both zero, they are both null, nothing happens, no harm done, right? But if they are pointing to something, first it's going to wipe those out. Then given name and surname is going to be set. 
So running this one more time to see how it's going to work out, this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to have over here uh, Fred. Oh. What did I do? Why did it stop? Uh, F5. How many names? Shh. Users are stupid. Even when you are testing your own program. How many names? Two. Okay. So Fred, Soleil, and now in here I'm going to have John and do okay and now it's coming over here to do what I want to do now take a look it goes inside okay you see this one is John and this one is Doe, right it goes to deallocate this one is pointing to John deleted John is gone now it's garbage this one is Doe, deleted now it's garbage now they are both set to name the sacred ritual is finished. I have to make it null afterwards. So now I come back over here and go into my given name. Now I have two fresh, clean, nice pointers to allocate whatever I want to, and then copy to it and be done with it. Now, when I print them one by one, we will see that uh, uh, the Homer Simpson thing is printed over there. And at the end, as soon as I, where's my mouse? Wow, I have to go all the way. And as soon as I delete them both, it says name zero is deleted, name one is deleted. Are we okay with this? Okay. So that's that. And the final thing before we leave, and we're going to end at 35. Uh, remember, I told you about this class. No break. We go 10 minutes early. Okay, but I gave you a small break that doesn't matter. Anyways, okay, so so stop that and so what the heck is the difference between struct and a name and and a class? Class. Potatoes, potatoes, nothing. One major difference, and this is an interview question. Usually, they tell you. In C++, if they tell you what is the difference between a C structure and a C++ class, that's easy. C structure cannot support methods, encapsulation. C++ supports encapsulation, privacy and methods. and That's fine. But what is the difference between a struct and a class in C++? The difference is that a struct is public by default. Everything inside the struct is accessible by default. A class is private by default. So essentially, if I have a class, although I always put the private over there, if you don't do it to, it doesn't matter. Everything that is inside the class is private by default, unless you make it public. That's the only difference. So what is the difference? And it's going to be your test, quiz, midterm, final. You're going to have this. What is the difference between a class and a structure and a class, uh, a, a class and a structure in C++? And be careful about that, because I'm going to play, you, play tricks with you. When I give you the question to see if you read, I'm going to say, what is the difference between a C structure and a C++ class? And then I'm going to say, what is the difference between a structure and class in C++? Two different completely answers. Remember that. So in C++, Classes and structures, a class is private by default, and the struct is public by default, unless you make it different. And just to let you know, we not only finished today's thing, but we went ha halfway through the second thing too. So week four is covered too. Okay? And that's that. OK, so uh, any questions? The current object is three seconds. I can mention it to you right now. Let me mention it to you right now.
No, I'm not going to mention to you. It's about a pointer. I'm just going to tell you what that pointer is. Okay? We have a special pointer in C++. Okay? That special pointer is called this. T-H-I-S. It's called this. And it only has a meaning when it's used inside the method. Okay? What is the number of this class? Hey, so, so you know you are in this class. That's what this does. When you go inside a class in C++, if you want to refer to class from outside, but within you call this. A perfect example for it, an awful example for it is this. I said perfect example, an awful example. Let's say I am stupid enough to call this M name. Uh, sorry, call this M surname. Right? Now, if I call this M surname, how do I know if I'm talking about the proper, the variable inside this, the argument inside this, or the attribute in the class? How do I distinguish between the two? And if I write over here M surname too, M surname, M surname. Yeah. If I do something like this, how do I know which one is what? Because this is called M surname, and this one is called M surname too. How do I know which one is what? That's where you can use this pointer. So in here, I can say this surname is set to new character argument surname. If M given name and this surname, SDR copy, M surname into this. So when you say this, it means classes. That's it. That's, and we use it for many different things. You will see it soon. It's, it, just know that THIS can only be used inside the method. In main, if you say this, it doesn't make sense. In a regular function, if you say this, it doesn't make sense because there is no class. But when you are inside a method, you can use this. And never, ever do this, ever. It's the most stupid thing you can do. To name the argument and the class the same and then use to this to distinguish which one is what. Because you will make a mistake and it's a bug that it's going to take five years to get fixed. <laughs> Because you don't know, like you write it, did I, is it, don't. That's why we have M underline. So don't do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment this, like, and I'm going to actually do it like this. Take a look. I'm going to actually do it like this. See, and I'm going to do it like that. And in here, I'm going to say, Just explaining what this is. This is stupid. Don't do this. OK? So I'm going to come back over here and remove all the garbage I have written. So this comes out. This comes out. This comes out. See, even fixing it is difficult. Uh, am I good? Is it OK? I hope so. Debug it, see if it works, or I made a boo-boo somewhere. I think we're good. Anyways, save and have a beautiful day, okay? It's up on the thing. It's, uh, it's posted right now.